universities, higher education in particular, should appreciate the value, the essential role of freedom of speech and higher education. Creation of knowledge and learning would be impossible without freedom of speech and expression. So many ideas, perhaps most ideas, are viewed as uh, so many new ideas, and perhaps most new ideas, are viewed as heresy or crackpot ideas when they're first introduced. It takes time for them to become accepted as truth. Uh, if we can't express those ideas in the first place, uh, we, we're just postponing the discovery of that truth. Uh, science and engineering uh, institutions like our research universities, like MIT and others, uh, more than any other should appreciate the importance of freedom of speech and expression. Uh, most new uh, ideas from science and uh, engineering were viewed as impossible or crazy when they were first stated. Galileo. Uh, was uh, viewed as uh, speaking heresy by the political establishment of his day, which was the Catholic Church. Uh, Newton uh, purposely wrote the Principia uh, in a cryptic uh, code so that uh, people couldn't uh, attack it and make fun of it. Uh, I wonder and worry about how many ideas are being held back today uh, and how much the advance of knowledge even today is being slowed by uh, a lack of openness to uh, new ideas, free speech and expression. Well, let me mention two things. One is committing to provide it, and then two, ensuring that they provide it on an ongoing basis. Because a commitment without an ongoing adherence to free speech and expression is useless. Uh, what are some of the ways a university can commit to free speech and expression? Well, one way is by formally adopting the Chicago Principles which were put forward by the University of Chicago and strictly limit departures from free speech and expression to such things as uh, physical attack and uh, child pornography and so forth. The more those limitations are expanded, uh, the more we intrude on civil society the more of an author authoritarian governance, whether at the university or of the federal government, we invite. Uh, the second thing uh, we can do is ensure that we comply with those principles on an ongoing basis. And that's the really hard part. And I rarely hear university leadership talking, reinforcing, reminding students, faculty, and staff of the importance of free speech and expression on campus. And so that's one thing uh, leadership at universities could do on an on a ongoing basis is reaffirming their commitment and, the, and reminding the entire university community of the importance of free speech and expression. We had a real crisis at MIT which led to the creation of the MIT Free Speech Alliance, and that was the disinvitation of Professor Dorian Abbott, one of the world's leading geophysicists. He was disinvited from giving a lecture about geophysics uh, because of his views on a completely unrelated subject, namely DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I can't think of a more egregious departure from free speech and expression in recent years. Well, that led to such an uproar of alumni and also in the press. I can't remember the last time the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal 
agreed on anything. Uh, but they both agreed MIT had made a mistake by uh, disinviting Professor Abbott. Alumni came together and formed the MIT Free Speech Alliance, and it came together and grew very quickly. Uh, it's only a year old. Within six or 12 months, six or eight months, they had over 700 members. I'm guessing there may be 800 members now. President Reif, Raphael Reif, uh, as a result of this uh, uproar, appointed a free expression working group to uh, determine what MIT's uh, policy on free speech and expression should be, and that led to the report, uh, which was just published and is available online, which includes, among other uh, great content, uh, MIT support for the Chicago Principles. So I would say to those at other universities, don't let a crisis go to waste. If you have a similar egregious departure from free speech and expression at your campus, uh, use that as an opportunity to uh, express your concerns. Let it be known that that's not acceptable. And uh, perhaps uh, ask or demand that your university, as a first baby step, support the Chicago Principles. One of the greatest existential threats facing the United States, I dare say, is polarization. It's tearing our country apart. Unwittingly, I believe, higher education is helping drive polarization. By not allowing free speech and expression, uh, f speech often goes underground. Uh, it becomes amplified, uh, and that helps drive us further apart. We've got to learn how to achieve civil discourse between folks who disagree and uh, thereby uh, help establish or reestablish civil society. So. Very often, people with different views in different polarizing camps actually have the same goals, even if they have different means. The goals are the same. We want to have affordable health care. We want to preserve the environment. We want world peace. Uh, but the means of getting there are different. Great. Uh, by focusing on means rather than goals, we can uh, consider the costs, the benefits, and the unintended consequences of the different means of getting there. And that way, have a more civil discussion that's more practical rather than ideological.